Welcome to the Empowered Spirit Show. This is your host, Terry Ann Hyman. I'll explore the connection to the human spirit in a way that helps to navigate your life, including crisis. I am passionate about helping you to open up to your intuition and the metaphysical world of spirit to find your confidence in your own inner guidance. Take a pause, be inspired, learn ways to show up focused, centered, and more dynamic in your everyday life. Welcome back to the Empowered Spirit Show. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining me today. This episode is being sponsored by Ritual and Shelter. Are you looking for a magical place to shop and hold space? Check out Ritual and Shelter online or in Homewood, Alabama. Browse through their bookshelves covering topics such as energy healing, crystal healing, Reiki, chakras, auras, the Akashic Records, shadow work, astrology, and earth-based healing. You can also find herbal teas and tinctures alongside their crystals and oils to help establish a mindful mindset and fluid ambience before meditation, ritual work, and reflection. Ritual and Shelter is dedicated to providing one-on-one in-depth conversations with customers to help them find the most efficient healing methods and resources that match their unique interest and energy. They offer tarot sessions, Reiki sound bowl, and crystal healing, and now they are offering witch consultations. Visit RitualShelter.com to book an appointment and bring peace back to the body, mind, and spirit. You can also find them on Instagram at Ritual Shelter Shop, as well as Pinterest at Ritual Plus Shelter. As this podcast goes to air, we've moved through the eclipse season, but yet there's still so much going on in the cosmic forces. A lot of us being impacted by these transitions, so much that we can start to understand more and more by tuning deep within. One of the things that really jumps out at me right now is Pluto. Pluto is doing this little dance back and forth, move back into Capricorn. Well, it was in Capricorn. Then it moved into Aquarius and then it retrograde back. And soon it is going to transition and stay in Aquarius until 2044. So what does this mean? This means that it is going to break up a lot of the structures that we've been seeing. Our political system, our government, technology is going to shift. All these structures that need to change. It encourages each of us to break free from the traditional constraints, explore new identities and new ways of being. And where I am, this hemisphere of the world that I live in, we are moving deeper and deeper into the fall season. It's a time when the veils begin to thin. It's a time when the physical and the spiritual realms become very thin, very close together, and we can begin to explore a deeper sense of our soul, consciousness, different realities, and lots of information and messages can come in. It is a time to open up with an increased sense of awareness of your own soul's work. It's a time for self-reflection, exploring the subconscious mind, and really expanding the ways in which you can show up. There is a collective shift going on, and right now is a time to open up to a deeper sense of our soul, create a spiritual practice, wake up, as I like to say, and tune in to the messages of your soul. And if you are looking for a spiritual teacher, a mentor, someone to help you create that spiritual practice, that is me. I help people to open up, to release all of those old imprints, to break the old patterns, the things that really hold us back, the limited beliefs, and learn how to set up a spiritual practice to expand their consciousness and trust their inner guidance. So I did want to share a quick testimonial from one of my clients, Regina Crane Mednick. She had been hit by a car and had a lot of physical pain. And so she came to me, but let's listen to the testimonial she sent to me. And I'm quoting her. I remember finding Terry Ann Hyman on Instagram early in 2021. I took her up on her free spiritual discovery call that she was offering. I told her I was blocked. I didn't even know what that meant at the time. I couldn't explain it. And that's not really something that can be handled in one call. She invited me to her mentoring program. I didn't really feel that I was looking for a spiritual mentor at the time, but I continued to follow her post just in case. In the spring of that year, I saw her 21-day radiant light challenge 
OMG, I love a challenge. I was in. I have done several of them since meeting her, meditating with her online group calls. There's just something about meditating with a group. Yoga means yoke union. And that's what this lady was serving up at 7 a.m. for 21 days. Good stuff. And if I missed it, she offered a replay on her app. You always win with her. In the years since, I've enjoyed 7 a.m. every Wednesday morning, Reiki, crystals, EFT, tapping, tarot, always eager to catch her new moon and full moon activations, received Reiki 1 and Reiki 2 certifications, browsed my Akashic Records with her, went on retreat with her to visit her medicine wheel, and a glamping retreat at Lando, Bahamia. And I've learned so much from her master class and her private mentoring offerings such as Monetize Your Energy. I have trained with her for four years now, both online and in person. But you know what? It's more than training. This is deep. She has guided and supported me through the pain of my healing body from both physical injuries and trauma held in my body from past relationships. We do boundary work. This helps me recognize my energy. We do restorative work for the soul. It's strange to call something so enjoyable work, but just like with anything else, you have to show up to get paid. I am blessed to have noticed Terry in my scrolling that day. So yes, I am a spiritual mentor, and I help people tap into their spirit to learn more about themselves. Gina continues to show up for herself, overcoming her physical injuries, and recently attracting the love of her life and getting married this summer. She teaches yoga classes at the Yoga Circle. You can find her there, as well as the gym in Aniana, and she works on Airbnbs with her pink tools, as she calls them. So amazing to see the growth in her. I have many ways in which I can guide you. And so I offer you the same. Schedule a complimentary spiritual upgrade breakthrough call with me. And let's see how we can help you move through the difficulties in your life, create a spiritual practice, and find the power of your soul. I'll put the link in the show notes. So in today's episode, I begin a series on expanding consciousness to really open up the way in which we view our life, our path, and our soul's work. We'll start with the work of Ralph Metzner. Great book. So much information with Kathy Coleman. Next week, we'll explore the work of Jim Morrison with Paul Wilde. Really great. The doors, right? Just in time for Halloween. Seen as a secret teacher of the occult. And then from there, I'll also be interviewing Bob Frissel and Barbara Hancloud. Today's interview with Kathy Coleman is about the book that she edited, compiled the information about memories and information about the amazing work of Ralph Metzer. He was considered brilliant by his colleagues and was associated with Timothy Leary, Ram Dass, Allen Ginsberg, Alec Hoffman, the founder of LSD. Ralph was a scholar, educator, mentor, psychologist, and an astrologer. His work in psychedelics and the psychedelic experience opened the door for so much research to follow, especially in death and dying. Ralph introduced courses in the Divine Feminine, laying the groundwork for the later emergence of a woman's spirituality program. He incorporated esoteric healing arts such as astrology, alchemy, and the I Ching into mainstream academic studies. He championed so much in his life. I could go on and on about his work, but the book does cover so much as we talk about in the episode. Before we move into talking with Kathy, let's take a moment to pause and center and set an intention to open up our minds. So wherever you are, if you can, close your eyes. Taking a nice deep inhale, breathing up the body. And as you exhale, call all your energy into you, slowing down. Inhale, expanding the breath up the body. And as you exhale, begin to align your energy, calling in the spiritual body to align right on top of the emotional, the mental, the physical bodies, centering, ground. Inhale, expanding the breath up the body. And as you exhale, drop into the heart, to the deepest part of your heart right here, feeling that connection, your spirit and the greater spirit. Know that you are loved, guided, protected, as we bring all this energy in around us, calling in our Reiki masters, our teachers, calling in the angels to open the heart with joy and love, 
calling in the crystal beings for amusement, magnification, calling in your higher self right above the crown to receive the messages for you. Taking a nice deep inhale and exhale as we take the time to notice in this great wheel of life. Notice where you are. As I teach, we find ourselves in the direction of the west where the sun sets each and every day. We notice the colors of the sunset. We notice the struggles at the end of the day. We notice the cycle of life. We harvest our work. We offer gratitude. And so we call in the directions to the west, the north, the east, and the south. Above us, Father Sky. Below us, Mother Earth. Right into the deepest part of our heart. We set an intention for this time. We set an intention to open up, to find ways to expand our consciousness, to find ways to feel that joy, that peace, that bliss of life. Inhaling and exhaling, releasing this out all around us, setting these intentions, feeling the heart open, feeling that third eye illuminating your path, receiving the messages. And as you're ready, like in the eyes back open, coming back. So my guest today, which was recorded a few weeks ago, is Kathy Coleman. She's a PhD, was Ralph Metzner's wife of 31 years from 1988 to 2019. She worked at the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIS, as Director of Student Services and later Dean of Students, where Ralph was Academic Dean and Professor. Kathy later worked as Executive Director of Earthrise Retreat Center at the Institute of Noetic Sciences as President of Kepler College, of Astrological Arts and Science, and with CIS Center for Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Research. She was co-founder with Ralph Metzner and is a current board member of the Green Earth Foundation. She is also a professional consulting astrologer. So let us listen in on the interview as we welcome her to the show. Let's welcome Kathy to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I feel very honored and I think as I kind of shared before we hit record, I was feeling a little intimidated. This is such amazing work that you have compiled. It really is. And I am a child of the 60s. I am. And I'm very familiar with kind of the circle of energy and all they were doing. But I think I mentioned too, I came into like kind of psychedelics a little bit later and how powerful and how much help they can bring out to the world. So I'm very grateful to bring this work forward. And when I saw it coming, like, yes, yes, I want to talk about this. So thank you. Yeah. So you were married to Ralph and you were married for 31 years. So I'm sure you have a lot of deep insight on that. <laughs> so how did this book come about? You edited it, you pulled it together. Like, well, what, what was the inspiration and why now? Well, I always, you know, a lot of scholars have books written by them, by fellow scholars, and they're called festrifts. And I always felt like he should have a festrift while he was alive, but it never came about. I mean, it just takes somebody, some academic colleague to, to do it. And then, but that was just on my mind. And anyway, then at his memorial, which I kind of carefully crafted, the memorial was about three months after he died, two months after he died. And one of the people that spoke at the memorial sent me the text like of his of his talk. And I thought it was really good. And I thought, oh, that may I I that should be published in some way. And then kind of independently, I mean he had a he had a large, you know, academic life in with a lot of German German people, a lot of people in Europe. And a man wrote to me and suggested this, suggested a festschrift. And I thought, well, there's my thought and these other two. And so Ralph has a, a newsletter called the Green Earth Foundation newsletter. And so I just put it out to that to those 4000 people in the newsletter and I just said I have this idea would anybody be interested in writing for it and I had 90 responses 
just right away. So anyway, it, that was just, it was kind of a no brainer then. I was like, okay, there's this many people that want to write. And I just worked on formulating it and <laughs> calling for the papers and all that. So yeah, that's how it came about. So how interesting. There was so much in the book. I know when I, I got it, I have not had a chance. As I mentioned, I just got the book and I looked at it. It was like, oh my gosh, there is so much in here. And I truly believe this is work that does need to come out into the world right now. And as I mentioned last weekend, I was at a conference about death and dying and all the many aspects of it. And there is a lot of information in there. So there is so much work. And I can only imagine what he went through in the early days, especially being believed, not being believed. Did he run from the police? I mean, like, how was that? How much of that do you know about him? I know quite a bit. I mean, I, you know, I spent, it was like, I was with him for 33 years and I know many of his friends and then I've done a lot of reading. And then of course this book, even like I would learn, you know, I learned new things and I've been interested. I mean, I'm like, he's had such an interesting life. I've been, I actually have all of his letters. I mean, his, his family kept all of his letters back and forth to his parents and for like since he was a child and on up through adulthood. So I've been reading those letters and getting even more insight. But anyway, he didn't really, I mean, he never had a brush with the law. I mean, he had a couple of really, really close encounters. Uh, actually, I read that when uh, Gordon Liddy raided Millbrook, um, he had actually gone to New York City and he was kind of subletting Rosemary Leary's apartment then so he was gone so he was away and that was just like you know pure luck and then another time actually when uh timothy leary and uh, tim and rosemary were arrested he was supposed to be he and his girlfriend were supposed to be going with them somewhere and his girlfriend got was sick so they didn't go those were the only two encounters that I know that were kind of close calls, but there was never anything else. He was actually very cautious, but yet such an explorer. So he, <laughs> he, he kind of oxymoron, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what did lead him to this study? I mean, I know more about like Ram Dass, Richard Alpert. I know more about that, a little bit more about Timothy Leary than I do here, but what led him? And he, I mean, you're calling him the, a psychedelic pioneer. What led him to this? He went to Harvard, he graduated from Oxford, and I learned from his letters, he wanted to try out being a psychologist. So he, he got a scholarship to Harvard and came over from England. And basically, he just ended up in the psychology department with Tim and Ramdas. And then they started this research, and he was a graduate student. There is a story in there from one of his colleagues, one of his colleagues from um, Harvard that was in his class. She said that she overheard some of the people or some of the professors talking about him one day. And one of them said something like, oh, he's the most brilliant student in our class. And the other professor said, no, he's the most brilliant student that's ever come through this program. Mm -hmm. So I think he was just brilliant, but he's very quiet. He's a very quiet person, brilliant, but also hardworking. And he was the one, as I understand it, he was the primary writer of the psychedelic experience. You know, he didn't have the big name and he wasn't a professor. He was their grad student, but he got the work done. He always got the work done. So um, yeah, scholarship to Harvard, I can only imagine and back in the 60s, that was the time, right? That was about the period he was there. Right, it, right. So 50s, 60s? He came there in 58. And then he graduated in 62. And I think he had his first experience. In fact, this is really interesting. And you're interested in death. This is one thing I've discovered. That I think it's quite interesting. So he died on March 14th. And just through, you know, reading all these things and looking, I've seen... This March 14th date come through as very significant in other ways in his life. So it's made me think, I wonder how many, for how many of us, like our death date is corresponds with other important things that happen in our lives. And so I know that he had his first psychedelic experience on March 14th, 1961. So 
I just think that's very, very significant. And also that was the same date that Tim Leary and Ram Dass were fired from Harvard. And that really changed everything. So anyway, those are, yeah, that's just a connection. I definitely understand what you're saying, because I do think we can have those kind of connections. And I do think I've had this conversation most recently. I recently lost someone very dear to me. And in her last few weeks, we were talking about this. It is our soul that chooses right? I mean, some people can last to 102 and some people can leave. We just lost somebody in our community that was only 65, right? And so how does that happen? But there is some kind of soul awareness or yeah. I don't know if that's the right word, but there is some kind of soul energy. And when we can explore that consciousness of our soul and open up and expand, so much more comes through. And as I was sharing after my mom died, COVID hit, I had a near death like experience and I got hit by a car and I, I left my body and came and I didn't realize, I really didn't realize what that did to me. And I feel like my soul has been wandering and I'm grateful that I have a lot of the spiritual tools that can keep me functioning, but it did send me on a search and it sent me on a search to work with some plant medicine. I was mm -hmm. kind of timid in my uh, high school days and college days in the seventies, right? I was kind of, you know, I was always like, you know, you know, cannabis, yes, but psychedelics, ooh, I don't know, right? And a few, I mean, we would go out into the cow pastures and pick some, right? I have some experiences with that, but really not in ceremony and not in kind of the consciousness of our soul and working with them. But I do feel during that period after my mom died and being in that state I was in, in the soul work, that I did start to look at it and still kind of trying to understand it and now finally feeling like, yes, now I am grounded. But I do think it was through the work of being able to open up my mind. And not all of it was psychedelics. I was down in Teote Tacano working with some Toltec energies and some sacred sites, and there was really no plant medicine. But I think all of it was helping me to expand the consciousness. And I think that's a big part of what the book shares. And as I was mentioning, there is some chapters in there, and you just mentioned too, about you know the Jewish mysticism and traditions and working with it and the separation of consciousness and how we can use it to understand consciousness doesn't live in the body. And I think that was a big part of what they were experimenting with. And then now to bring it out and to really go back and look at some of his work. And he was of a brilliant mind. How did y'all meet? Well, I came to the California Institute of Integral Studies um, in 1981 as a graduate student. So first he was my professor. So in my piece in the book, it's called The Sacred Hoop of Partnership. I had him for quite a few classes because he taught a lot of different courses. And then I started working there in student services about a year later. So he was the academic dean and I was the director of student services. So basically I oversaw the non-academic part of the school and he oversaw the academic part. So for about 10 years, we worked in tandem like that. And so we got to know each other as fellow administrators and then the relationship came out of that. The rest is history. There you right. go. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So interesting how those two blended together as well. Yeah, all of that. And I feel very fortunate that to have been in a long marriage with someone who, you know, just had the same interests as mine. I mean, I got a doctorate in East-West psychology, which he actually had conceived of and created. So we really had the same, very similar interests. He was way more into psychedelics than I was, way more into astrology, but he also was an astrologer. And so we had so many far out interests we shared. It was great, really. <laughs> Yeah. And I think, you know, I often refer back to, you know, I was born in the late fifties, grew up in the sixties, went off to summer camp. Right. And, and so I had some of that, what we call pre-dawning of Aquarian energy. Like I really did. It was embedded in me and it brought me into a place where, you know, now I can accept it easily where a lot of people have trouble understanding. And I think that's why I can accept spirituality and working in the energy field. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. I think that's why I can but I think all of this is really important. And I know in today's society, let's just bring this work forward because had it not been for this work that he's done, we really wouldn't have much to draw on. And the way in which government, pharmaceutical companies, whatever, they try to control so much, we really wouldn't have this to fall back on. And I think we are in need of ways to expand our consciousness. Now, I'm also of the teachings that let's not just depend on that. 
right? Let's open up the consciousness and then know that we too can tap in through our own soul, the work that we do. And I think that's an important aspect that comes forward as well. Right. Yeah. Were you surprised by any of the letters that you got or any of the writings that came through? Or did you kind of know it all anyway? <laughs> hmm. I don't think there was any major surprise at all. I would say about 80 to 90% of all the writers I know personally, a few of them in Europe, and there were 27 more essays that came in that are in this book. So anyway, some of the European ones I hadn't met personally, a couple of people here in the States, but mostly I know all these people. So, so there really wasn't too much, but you know, there were certain little individual stories like, like Stan Groff's story, for example, of meeting Ralph at like, and Timothy Leary. It was the first time he was over here in the United States and he was at a conference and lecturing and he needed to get to get somewhere. And so he asked if anybody would give him a ride. And so this person who was actually the, an editor of the Psychedelic Review, he said, well, yeah, I, I'll give you a ride, but I have to make a stop on my way. So he had to make a stop at Millbrook. And that's where Ralph and Timothy were at the time. Ramdas wasn't there. But anyway, and then there's a photo in here of the signed book of the psychedelic experience that they gave to Stan Groff. So just, you know, certain things like that. It's no surprise, but it's an interesting story. And then Ralph and Stan, you know, just they they were really close friends all their life. So it is interesting, right? Sometimes we think people that play around with psychedelics, they aren't that smart, but it's just such the opposite. It is our brilliant minds that can help us open up. Now, I see that you also are connected to noetics. Was he also part of that? He wasn't. Well, I mean, he wasn't in terms of a job, but he actually, even before I went there, he would sometimes worked with their board of directors and led them on explorations, mostly psychedelic explorations. Most of them did. I don't think it, it wasn't like it was a required thing, but he had a connection to many of their board of directors, including their president for a while, Wink Franklin. He was close to him and yeah, had done some work with him. And he knew Willis Harmon, who was a longtime president. That's just really it. It was kind of a dotted line, lots of connections of yeah. People and well, I know that in their work, they do still carry on so much research on consciousness and soul work and really like having those abilities to channel and to really connect. And today, I think it's so important. It is the work I do. So I'm obviously going to say that, but you're hearing more and more people say, yeah, I channel. Yeah, I do this. Yeah, I do that. And there is an awakening coming. Finally, I <laughs> say finally, right? And it is important that we start to recognize that science does back a lot of this experiment going on and that there are other ways. And depression today is huge. COVID left us with such a huge amount of mental illness. And they're finding that some of the techniques they always thought was working isn't. So we do need to find ways. And I will say, all right, I'm going to be very vulnerable. I said I may not share this, but I will say over these past five years in trying to understand what happened to me and losing my mom and, and that, that car crash I was in and like, where am I? What am I doing? What am I purpose? That it did allow me to have a little bit of guidance in there so that I didn't have to fall into deep depression. And I think that's really important. And I don't know enough about end of life care, but it is something that I will I will start learning about. And I think that's another way to look at it because having people hang on to machines is not the way to live. And again, that's an opinion, right? And everybody's free to have that opinion, but that's the way I feel. And if we can have easier ways, I know I worked with someone about maybe five, six years ago helping her husband pass. And so she asked me, can I help? And I'm like, I, I don't have the experience. I wished I did, right? And so there was a case there that, yes, I do think it's valuable. And I know here in Alabama, we don't have the laws for it, but I know there are other states that are getting the laws for it. And I know in Canada too, there's more as well, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we do need to make this available. Well, Ralph did think that one of the greatest gifts maybe of psychedelics was to help people feel more comfortable about dying. And there are quite a few studies with that have been done now with like, you know, stage four cancer patients and a lot of results where people actually have reduced their anxiety by a, by a lot. 
And his yeah. own death. I mean, his own death was a great testament. I mean, it was so very peaceful and easy. He knew he was going to die. And he just was so accepting and open. And it was really a beautiful death. And he could have had medications to prolong his life, but he didn't want to do that. So yeah, it does take a brave soul for sure. I don't know. I mean, there's so many parts to this book. There's probably something for everybody in here. You know, it's like different parts of it would speak to different people. Yeah. <laughs> I think it does speak to different people. I was so intrigued without even really knowing what I was saying yes to. Like, yes, I want her on the show. But I didn't I didn't realize either. But I think there's a world of information here. And I think that there can be so much. And I do feel in today's world... It gives us something to fall back on. I, I admit, I knew more of Ram Dass's work. I lived in New York. I did all my education in New York. I was in the ministry in New York. And I feel like some of that came through because of that. And we used several of Ram Dass's books, How Do I Heal? So I feel like that part, but because of that, I feel like, yeah, I probably do know him, right? I probably do know that work. So there is so much more that we can learn. And sometimes we have to look back to history to go forward. Right. And especially when so many people say, oh, no, it's bad. It's not safe. No, that's not true. And for a brilliant mind to be able to bring this forward, I think we need to really take notice. And our healthcare system does need help. It really right. does. We can't keep doing what we're doing. And the expansion of consciousness is what everybody's talking about. And you probably see this in your astrology world as well. How many more people are interested? I mean, I noticed all the time when I first moved to Birmingham, like not many people were talking about moon circles and not many people were talking about the full moon, you know, and now everybody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about the portals of energy. Maybe I just get in my own world, but I do think so. I think more and more people are awakening. And I think that's part of it. And in some ways, astronomy and the stars, people can relate to a little bit more than these little magic mushrooms growing from the earth. But right. I think it's important that we do embrace a way in which we can open up our consciousness and know that it's okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and Ralph really saw psychedelics as just being one vehicle toward expanding consciousness. I mean, I didn't even have psychedelic in the original title that I gave to Inner Traditions. And then they slightly changed it to put psychedelic in there i think so they would sell more books but he was about so many more things than just psychedelics and in fact he had a process he called alchemical divination which was teaching people these processes of really expanding consciousness i guess that would be the overall arching term without psychedelics so it could kind of be with or without i think we need both yeah I'll have to find those chapters myself because, yeah, it does say explorer of consciousness and then underneath the life and legacy of a psychedelic <laughs> pioneer. And, yeah, they're good marketers because that did jump out at me, too. Right. <laughs> and so that's what got me to look at it a little further, because I do believe we need this information to come out into the world. I mean, that's kind of why I started my podcast. When I moved back to Birmingham to help my parents, nobody really kind of grasped what I was talking about. And so I kind of went into the yoga world. That seemed like the easiest way in. But still, there was a huge amount of people like, you can't talk about that here. And it really was that near-death experience that I had to say, hey, wait a minute, woman. Like, like you have not opened up enough. You are you're like, you've been shutting down. It's time to open you up and really share this work. And so, yeah, I think it is important. And I think there has been a lot more research. But I think as we go back and find that there are many ways that we can, and this is a big, important one. And he was a valuable teacher for a lot of us. And that we can use it as research. So I, I am grateful. And again, I do need to spend more time with it for sure, because there is so much information. You might be interested. There's a chapter in here on that um, a man named Matt McKay wrote on channeling. Matt is the founder of New Harbinger Publications. And his son was my son's best friend. And he was murdered uh, when he was 23. And... Hmm. My husband then invited Matt to come and work with him to channel his son, Jordan. And so Matt has written a number of books now, like four or five books, I think, on um, the afterlife and channeling his son, et cetera, that he learned from my husband. And Matt has never done psychedelics. He's not into psychedelics at all, but this was a vehicle for for him to work with that he could. I have really... to laugh. That's where I uh, eared my book last night. 
I, I said like, okay, wait a minute. Cause I was falling asleep. Like I was so tired. I, yeah. I'm like, I, wait, 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 this is important. Yeah. So I did have to come back and I did, I kind of earmarked it down like that because I do think it's important. And for a long time I was, I was kind of like, no, don't, you know, a lot of people I saw were using psychedelics at like uh, music concerts and big crowds. Right. And to me, that's not really the way to do it. Okay. My opinion again. So I had to come about it from a different way been to Costa Rica, work with the shamans. Everybody's got their own journey. And that kind of became mine after my mom died. Like, what is going on with me? I don't understand. Right. But it really was in Teotihuacan, as I mentioned, no, no plant medicine and having the experiences in these ancient sites and seeing colors and orbs and auras of the pyramid that like, wow, now maybe that was a long lingering effect. <laughs> I don't know, but there was something that was able to open up inside of me. And again, I stand behind, we need both. We can't just depend on one. And I know through some of the microdosing I did, it's like, okay, a few days, but now I got to take a break and I got to let it integrate. And then I don't go back to it. And then I go back, right? And so I know it did help me ground back into who I was. Mm -hmm. And it is a big proponent of helping us to heal. And I do feel that we do need to catch up with it and bring it forward. And I know a couple of people that are working with people out West, you know, to be like guides and teachers and helping people to understand it. And I think it's really important, but I do think we also need the spiritual teachings and knowing that we can learn to channel, we can learn to do this. And right now the cosmic forces, as you know, <laughs> they are churning up there. They are big, big time moving around. And some of the energy is kind of coming back around to where we were. I see that in my work, coming back to where I had put some of my work on hold because, because of life, that kind of thing. So I'm very grateful for this. Tell us a little bit about your astrology work. Are you still doing that? Do you do readings? Tell us a little bit about you. I do. I've been, I, you know, as I said, when I met Ralph, I was an administrator. So I've done a lot of administrative work. I was the executive director of the Institute of Nordic Sciences Retreat Center for about 12 years, which I really loved also. But anyway, I, um, and then I come back in and uh, I've gone back to CIS and they have a psychedelic training program they have since the year 2016 so I've worked with that program since then I retired just now kind of this past year from the administrative day-to-day -day. I still help with the trainings and I still mentor I have a mentor group and I, I enjoy that astrology has always been my I've been practicing since I was about 30 years old so maybe 40 40 some years and I I love that work. And that's always been kind of in addition to everything else. Now it's just kind of my primary work, which I take as it comes. I have a few students and yeah, I have private clients that, that I work with. When Ralph and I got together, he was also a psychologist and an astrologer. And he just did a few readings on the side. And then he just kind of said, will you be the astrologer? I'll be the psychologist. <laughs> I thought he got the better end of the deal in some ways because, you know, <laughs> the psychology clients come back over and over and pretty much you're just, uh, you don't have too much repeat. Um, with I'm a repeat astrologer. Yeah. I've been having different ones on the, on the uh, podcast. My mother actually, back when I was going through my first like major trauma in my life, she had met an astrologer here in Birmingham and it was very hushed. Mm -hmm. very not accepted in her world. So it was very quiet, but my mom was the one that really kind of introduced me to her and it was very valuable with what I was going through. And then from there kept learning and I, I don't call myself an astrologer, but boy, do I follow it. And I am learning more and more, the more like every summer I try to learn something new and, you know, and I think it is a valuable asset to who we are and it shows us stuff about ourselves. Right. It really does. Yeah. So I think it is quite valuable and I do think it can guide us to understanding I don't know. There's just something about all of us having that individual blueprint and recognizing our soul vibration. I really do. I think it's quite valuable. I write an astrological blog every week about the astrology of the week. So I've probably done it for, I don't know how many years now, maybe 15 What's years. What's the name of it? Time. It's called In the Stars. It's at my website is kathycolemanastrology.com. And that's where you can sign up for it for free. But yeah, you have a new subscriber for sure. <laughs> I, I, I like it. Western or Vedic? Well, I'm primarily Western. That's how I started out. I know Western inside out, but I've also studied Vedic for about 30 years. So I'm a fairly good Vedic astrologer too. So I look at both. Now I'm studying Hellenistic astrology. I like seeing and knowing all different traditions, but I like Hellenistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I do. I think those are mostly, yeah, <laughs> most of my readings. Well, I'm going to have to reach out for a reading for sure. So it is all quite fascinating. I'll put your information for your astrology as well as this book on the um, links in the show notes and a shout out to Inner Traditions for publishing it and really just adding that extra little word in there to wake us all up, I think. So as we go to close, I do like to come back and ask if you would leave us with an uplifting thought about the importance of this work right now and really his life and how it can help to empower the spirit for all of us right now. I think some of his messages that come through are just healing as possible, no matter what, like spiritual healing and physical healing, and that we're all interconnected, and that death is really a part of life and nothing to be feared. We're kind of endless, creative, and unfolding beings with so much potential, and to listen to all the voices and messages and honor those things so that we live a really full vibrant life i agree yeah healing is possible and we are all interconnected we really are and this change is coming forward and it will take a raising consciousness to help us really understand that it is possible we have to get out of the fear we do and i know for years i lived there and through this and maybe this is partly how, but through this, I have finally found a way to do that. And what a relief, what a grounding and a sense of self that I do feel and in connection with all my community. It is a big difference for me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Really. Well, I am very okay. honored to talk to you yeah. and to talk about this work. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us today. Thank you, thank Terry. You. Okay. Your spirit. I forgot they're supposed to put a note about the cover of the book in there and they forgot these people on the front are it's Ramdas on the left on the far left and then okay. Alan Ginsberg that's what I thought Albert Hoffman the founder of LSD this okay of LSD, and then Ralph they okay. were at a conference in 1977 that is very interesting and what a great generation of people it really is mm -hmm.